Welcome, Dr. Dave Stukas. It's Food Allergy Awareness Week. Happy uh, Food Allergy Awareness Week to you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, happy Food Allergy Awareness Week to you as well, Gwen. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. It's a really important uh, week and month, uh, you know, to talk about uh, food allergies, asthma, it, it, the whole gamut EOE during the, uh, um, you know, during the, the month. And this is the big week. Um, but, you know, we're going to talk, I think, uh, about a few themes here, you know, food allergy management and that finding balance, which can be difficult sometimes for some people, especially if they're dealing with multiple food allergies. A really important thing that arises again and again, when to use epinephrine. And we're going to touch on, I'm, I'm so glad you agreed to talk a little bit about this because it's a, a, a complex area, but just a little bit on some of the future therapy options. So um, welcome. And I should should mention that uh, you're here today also uh, wearing your hat for Quad AI. Do you want to mention what that is? Oh, absolutely. Thank you. I'm the social media editor for the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. So do a lot of work with the Academy. Um, and yes, we're sort of uh, co-hosting co this together, but uh, uh, I'm ready to chat. Okay, let's do it. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, here we are. We're on social media. And um, you, in particular, have talked a lot about uh, misinformation that can arise on social media. Can you just give us a little bit about what your concerns are about that? Yeah, you know, uh, I've been involved in, with social media as a medical professional for about a decade. Uh, and the reason I first joined was because of all the misinformation and misconceptions that were being shared. And I wanted to be a conduit and try to provide good evidence-based information. Um, and unfortunately, in many ways, I think it's only gotten worse, uh, which is kind of scary. But is uh, there, there's great ways to use social media. I think for um, those who have food allergies or concerns about food allergies, it's a great starting point to find uh, others who suffer from it as well. And they, they can offer great resources. Uh, recipes are great for it. Uh, just social support of what it's like to live with it. Practical tips for travel, sending your kids to school, um, all kinds of things like that. But you know, the other side that I see, unfortunately, is there is a lot of just incorrect, outdated information. Uh, people love to share their own personal anecdotes on social media, but we all know that, you know, with anecdotes, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's actually evidence of anything. And there's always pieces of the puzzle that are missing and not being shared. Uh, so I just always recommend a lot of caution for those who go online to look for information about food allergies or really anything pertaining to your health. Um, try to use vetted resources such as Allergic Living Magazine, the professional organizations, advocacy organizations, medical professionals. Um, and, you know, if, if you ever encounter information that causes concern, please take it back to your own personal doctor or allergist. I'm hopeful that they'd be willing to uh, discuss it with you. I love when families come to me with, I get this all the time. It, sometimes it's just a message to the electronic medical record. Hey, Dave, I saw this study. Uh, what do you think about it? And more often than not, it's, oh, that sounds really interesting, but it's probably like five to 10 years away from being available because <laughs> of the way clinical trials right. work. So yeah, take it back to your own doctor and ask them, you know, I read this online. Does it pertain to my health and my child's health and have that conversation? I think that's great advice. And um, I, I'd add too that in terms of food allergy management, um, we always encourage people to uh, you know, get out there and live life to uh, you know, do things like you maybe can't go to every restaurant. Look, I have shellfish, peanut, and soy allergy. I'm not walking into a Chinese restaurant. It's just not fair to them. I mean, you know, like there are certain things you can't do, but you can find those places that can serve you, even with, for instance, multiple food allergies. Um, you can travel. I always say that when you live with food allergies, it's like it's sort of life with homework. Everything is about being prepared. And I like to say, you know, to be prepared, not scared. And I, I know it can be a lot of work, but especially when I, I talk to families and they have uh, young children and they say, well, we're just never going to go to, for instance, a restaurant. And I, I said, well, that's okay. But what happens that fine day when they turn 16 and they want to go out to the local restaurant with their friends after school? So you you want to help them and, and be a role model for them and, and, and help them practice to learn about, you know, what does mom do to ask questions about the restaurant? How do you, you know, how do you go there? What What's a chef card and why should I carry it? 
all those kinds of things. And it can make just a huge difference. And same with the school, like you just have to do that talking and approach it in a calm way and, and have your facts. But, you know, I, I do hear from, um, you know, when we're doing awareness, some of that awareness is, you know, even in our own community, not, you know, we need to help with other people too understanding food allergies, because that's a big issue. Um, but, you know, uh, I'm sure you have thoughts on some of this as well. No, Gwen, I'm really glad that you brought that up. Um, you know, we're going to talk about anxiety, I'm sure, and every conversation surrounding food allergy should address that because we know that that exists and that can negatively impact somebody's quality of life when they're managing food allergies or for their children. And going back to the social media piece that you sort of led with, I, I, I hope people also understand that there, there's a delicate and kind of sad aspect where a lot of people turn to social media um, almost as their therapy session in some ways, and they really share their deepest, their deepest darkest secrets and anxieties. Um, and it can get very emotional uh, when talking about some of these topics. Um, and, you know, just because somebody's putting out, you know, all their, their scariest thoughts, it doesn't necessarily mean that that pertains to you if you're reading it. Uh, so if you read something online and all of a sudden it, it increases your anxiety or your own fear, or it leads you to change things that you were doing that you've proven to be safe, like going to restaurants or social engagements or things like that, again, please discuss with your personal allergist and, and hopefully they can, you know, um, address those things with you. Yeah. And, you know, as journalists, we do occasionally have to cover uh, a tragedy in this community. Um, and it's important to know about them in a sense, to know what went wrong. And we always try, though, in our coverage to say, you know, was epinephrine used? And almost invariably, it was used late or not at all. So that's something that people have to know. And they have to almost look at those kinds of experience or, or negative experiences as somebody had a bad reaction at a restaurant and say, well, before I just say I can't do this again, mm -hmm. what went wrong there? Right. And, uh, you know, I mean, I'm never one to sit in judgment if somebody's, you know, child, God forbid, died. You know, I, I mean, errors can be made and we're not here to 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 say that. But it's more about um, knowing that where are your points of control? How do you do your management? How do you improve your own? How do you maybe use it as a reminder? Just have I checked in with my teen lately? You know, so there's there's definitely some uh, some things that uh, that can be done. You know, and the other thing about food allergy management, I have to say, it can be so empowering. You get out there and you do things. We just did an article, and and we'll put a, a you know, it'll be uh, up on our Instagram page and and elsewhere. But this young guy named Pete's shoe. I don't know if you saw it or not, but he's a guy who has, he's, he's, uh, he, he's was in and out of the hospital. He's, uh, as a child, he has uh, multiple food allergies, EOE, celiac disease, asthma, had a heart defect that he outgrew and he's playing for, for, uh, Oklahoma for the Sooners. Uh, you know, that's him and he's going to college and he's working so closely with the chef there and she takes it as a challenge and it's really inspiring if you need to get inspired see stories like that too it's not all negative on social media so that's and we have some great sites as well you know one uh, pops to mind is nurse susan kelly is a, a co-runs one called uh uh, friends helping friends with food allergies, they're always looking for the way to make it happen. So those are good resources too. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, it, it's a positive path towards management is something we promote uh, at our center, that's for sure. You mentioned anxiety. Did you want to say anything more about that? Yeah, I just want to, you know, um, reinforce what you mentioned. Everybody... I, you know, I'm just going to say, I think everybody who has food allergies or has a child with food allergies, they will have some level of anxiety. That's a normal part of the diagnosis. We try to normalize that here. We actually have two psychologists on our staff uh, that meet with families regularly just because it, it's a big part of this. Now, there's helpful anxiety and then there's unhelpful anxiety. Helpful anxiety um, reinforces the need to read labels, even for foods that you've eaten on a regular basis every single time you eat them. Uh, uh, helpful anxiety reminds you to have your epinephrine auto injectors with you at all times. And it helps you, you know, communicate with food handlers when you go to restaurants and bakeries and go out for ice cream and things like that. So that's helpful anxiety. When it's unhelpful is when it leads you to not do those things and uh, not go to restaurants because you have a, a heightened perception of risk associated with that. Um, it, or if it keeps you up at night or if it leads to um, highly restricted diets, we're seeing that more and more 
um, due to overuse of allergy testing and these food sensitivity tests and everything, you know, people come in to see me and they're avoiding 35 different foods and we have to walk everything back and it takes, you know, a long time to sort of do that. So if you notice these sorts of patterns with yourself, that may be a sign that maybe that anxiety isn't so helpful anymore. I think those are really great points. I also say, try to find your comfort zone. I mean, mm -hmm. maybe you're not ready for a trip to Thailand, but maybe you're ready for a trip to Disney World, you know? So, you know, it just and where they, they you know, go out of their way to uh, to be allergy friendly. I should also just mention when we're mentioning some resources, uh, uh, a person you've done some work with in past, Tamara Hubbard mm -hmm. runs the food, uh, what is it called? Food Allergy Counselor Group. And mm -hmm. like, it's like a list. So if you need a therapist in your area or whatever, that would be helpful. Can we talk about epinephrine, Dave? Please. <laughs> okay. I am so uh, concerned about the number of times I still see people saying how they hesitated. And there's a lot of studies. Uh, we even did a, a piece uh, on uh, Julie Wang out of uh, Dr. Wang out of Mount Sinai. I did a, a study, uh, you know, just looking at the level of hesitation with, with uh, uh, auto injectors. And it really is too high. What can we do about that and about needle fear and so forth? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's not just patients and families, it's medical professionals as well. I mean, it's, it's well established. Even from when people go to the emergency room, they're more likely to get um, steroids, which don't treat anaphylaxis at all, uh, than they are epinephrine. So, yeah, we just need to keep promoting it. it it's safe. It works fast. It's highly effective. Um, and it, it's a great medicine. Uh, I know that needles cause a lot of concern for folks. Um, but I, I just want to relay my own personal experience, as well as that from my colleagues and the families I work with, it actually doesn't really hurt. Um, and if somebody is experiencing anaphylaxis, which is a rapidly progressive allergic reaction that can involve any part of the body, and generally we diagnose it by saying there's more than one part of the body involved. Um, there's misconceptions. I think some people think that anaphylaxis means your throat swelling is shut and you're going to die instantly. That's not anaphylaxis. It's not typically what we see. That can occur, but that's the extreme. Typically, it's more, I don't feel well. Or if you have a young child, they look like they don't feel well. They're not happy and playful. You can see combinations of hives on the skin, swelling typically of the face or sometimes the hands. You can have nausea and vomiting associated with that. You can develop persistent cough, particularly in somebody who has asthma. They may have wheezing as well. Upper respiratory symptoms like severe acute onset nasal congestion in the setting of that allergic reaction can be a sign of anaphylaxis as well. The setting matters. When it comes to food allergies, you typically need to eat the food to cause anaphylaxis, and it's gonna happen pretty soon after eating it, not hours and hours later, um, because all of these symptoms can absolutely occur for non-food uh, allergy related reasons. So this is the tricky part of just trying to be comfortable with what's the diagnosis. But once anaphylaxis occurs, epinephrine treats all of those symptoms. Every single one of those symptoms, it goes right to that part of the body, it reverses the effect, it makes people feel better almost immediately. It works within minutes. Um, I can actually attest to the feeling better. I, I you yeah. know, I, I've had anaphylaxis a few times and it's, a, it, I always say it's like, it's turning off the pain tap. So if, if your child's a little afraid or something, if you can just say, look, just hang in there with me for, it's going to take a, a second and you're going to feel so much better. You know, I yeah. mean, I think I, I can absolutely swear by it. <laughs> it does, you know. And to that point, if you're worried about, you know, pain from a needle or needlephobia, oh my gosh, why prolong it? I mean, it makes you, anaphylaxis makes you feel really, really bad, right? You can tell better than anybody. Yeah. Um, and I'm a fan that. also of the, you know, practice once in a while, you know, take oh. the expired one, use an orange, you know, just no, normalize it a little more. I, th I think it's partly, I, you deal with it every day, but me personally, I think it's partly when you haven't had to do it in a long time and then it comes up and you're kind of like, oh, wait a minute. And you always have that thing too. Of, Am I overreacting here? No. <laughs> if the symptoms are there, go for it. <laughs> Look, again, I mean, even if you just have hives, use it. It'll make you feel better. I'm not saying that that's the first line, but if you're yeah. questioning it, use it because the safety, you know, the, the other thing people think like Pulp Fiction or your heart's going to explode or stuff like that. And the dose that's given in these auto injectors, it's extremely unlikely for any major side effects to occur, especially with the heart. If you look through all the literature, that all comes from like giving it through intravenous boluses and things like that. So very different way of administering it. It's safe. Mm -hmm. Use it. It works fast. It'll make you feel better. A lot of people seem to still have go to your antihistamines first on their uh, anaphylaxis emergency plan. Is that changing among the allergists? Is that, is that, uh, or is there, what's the role for antihistamines, I guess I'd say? Well, you know, 
if it's anaphylaxis, it should be epinephrine. Uh, the question is always, well, if you just have hives, is that going to progress to anaphylaxis? And that we don't know. But what I can reassure folks by saying is if it's just hives, treat the hives. So if it's just skin symptoms, you can certainly start with an antihistamine and then see if you start to feel better if things you know progress or not. Uh, and then as soon as they change, that's when I would definitely use the epinephrine. You're not going to mask anaphylaxis by giving uh, antihistamines. I can tell you that. Um, well, and people have heard that. That's one that has circulated on social media. So <laughs> we come full circle. Well, look, uh, just, Gwen, just ask anybody who has seasonal allergies and they take their antihistamine every day and they still have anaphylaxis. They'll tell you that it, it ain't going to. It, it isn't going to happen. It doesn't have <laughs> the strength to do that, does it? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, we, we should mention one other thing that's coming up is, uh, that we do have these novel sort of epinephrine sprays and, um, it, so sort of a, a non-needle approach is also being looked at. Uh, what do you want to say about that? I know we, we haven't seen anything approved yet. There's an under the tongue film there's, uh, and there are two different forms of nasal sprays. Uh, got thoughts on those? It's fantastic. Uh, these are exciting times. Um, so there are two different novel types of nasal sprays and one that goes under the tongue as well. So I'm, I'm predicting in the coming months to years, we're going to have these viable options. I think it's important for folks to understand a couple of things. One, uh, there's no randomized controlled trial that has ever shown that epinephrine treats anaphylaxis compared to anything else. There's also no randomized controlled trial that shows that, you know, parachutes save lives when you jump out an airplane. Uh, we've used it for decades. It works well. It's very safe. Uh, so I say that only because we're not going to have head-to-head -head studies in human beings uh, comparing a nasal spray to the epinephrine auto-injector. What we are going to have are the same studies that looked at the auto-injectors and intramuscular injections. We'll look at pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic data. So draw the blood of people who receive these and see what happens with the levels of epinephrine um, throughout the body and, and things like that. Um, so, so far from what I've seen, they look very promising and very reassuring. So um, that's what we're going to sort of have out there. And, you know, once these are approved, then, you know, I think it's it's going to come down to just comfort level from allergists and from patients. Um, I'm, I'm assuming we're going to have practice devices that get people used to actually holding them and seeing how small and lightweight they are and easy to use. And then from practical purposes, I bet if people, you know, opt to use some of these, they're going to have that overlap where they still have their auto injector available as well. So they'll give them that comfort zone that buffer zone for a period of time also very exciting um we are treating now uh, fairly regularly uh food allergies do you do you do this in your practice are you doing oit or sublingual or how about we you do yeah it? yeah we offer yeah. oral immunotherapy yeah so we i mean we have viable treatment options um and there's more coming down the pike and uh, when i see families in the office I tell them whatever conversation we have today is going to change completely in the next three to five years. These are truly exciting times. You really think it's going to be that soon, do you, that we're we're going to see this stuff? Well, I think uh, I know some of the biologics are going to go for uh, approval um, fairly soon. So that's going to be a nice option as well. But yeah, it's important for folks to realize that none of these currently offer a cure, at least a reliable cure in the majority of people for food allergies. But what we can reliably do for the most part is desensitize people. Uh, these, this has to be done under supervision because it, it is a medicalized process where we're intentionally giving people small amounts of their food allergen that they have to receive pretty much every day when they're at home. Now there's protocols involved to try to um, reduce the risk associated with that. But for most people, they can build up to a maintenance dose, which then gives them that buffer zone. So if they used to have severe allergic reactions after eating a very, very minute amount of the food part of fruit allergen, um, that gives them a buffer zone where they have to eat much more of it to cause a severe reaction. The treatment's ongoing. It lasts years and years and years, uh, but it's a viable option that's been used for a long time. Yeah. And, and well, and, uh, you know, we had uh, one FDA approved uh, product and OIT, uh, Will sublingual become uh, FDA approved or does it just work uh, off label or or how does that work? People wonder about that. Yeah, you know, it's going to be a while if it does. My suspicion is for, in order for it to do that, we'll have to have a company that actually manufactures a very specific product, kind of like what we saw with the peanut oral immunotherapy, and then they'll have to go through all the regulatory channels and things like that. Um, you know, th that's the same thing with aeroallergens. There's a lot of folks who give sublingual immunotherapy for every aeroallergen, but there's only three or four that are actually, you know, covered in approved tablets. Um, so we'll see what this space sort of, sort of shows us. The early results look, look fairly promising for sublingual. Um, there's some logistics involved, just like there is with oral immunotherapy, but I think that we're going to see a little more widespread adoption of that in the coming years as well. Okay. And just related to that, uh, you know, with, with treatments, 
it comes up again when people are looking at undertaking one of these, the importance of so many people with food allergy also have asthma. Mm -hmm. What about asthma control in food allergy? Just how key is that? Yeah, you know, not everybody's a great candidate for these treatment options um, because, you know, it can trigger allergic reactions or worsen existing conditions. Uh, so we know that those who have had eosinophilic esophagitis probably aren't a good candidate because uh, it can often lead to a flare of that condition. Uh, same with asthma. If you have poorly controlled asthma, we need to get your asthma under control before we even think about trying to desensitize towards your food allergies. That's the that's the real thing that uh, that's going to cause issues with you and, and cause, you know, either increased risk for reaction from treatment or things like that, or it can delay the ability to reach that maintenance dose. So um, it all, it, it, this is where shared decision-making is, is really vital. Um, and anybody who's considering oral immunotherapy needs to have that long conversation with their own personal allergist of why am I pursuing this? What are the risks entailed? What are the benefits? What am I, what are the expected outcomes? And more importantly, what I like to talk to families about, what does this look like every day? There are some families who are like, oh, well, that's what it entails. There's no way we can do that because we're going yeah. between soccer practice and then we're shuttling, you know, four different yeah. kids and we're traveling. And, and I say, yeah, maybe that's not the, you know, the best thing for you at this point. And that's okay. But maybe that's where in the not too distant future, something like a, a biologic treatment. And there are, it should mention, there's the one that you're referring to that's farthest along, but there are also others coming in, in the pipeline and, you know, who knows, they may turn out to be very promising uh, or there's even things like uh, in Australia, they're working on this synthetic peptide uh, uh, vaccine. So that's a different approach. So there's actually a few things in the works or, or they're not. Yes. Yeah. So if you recall, um, and I know you do, but this was what, 20, 30 years ago, they were looking at vaccines for peanut allergy, but they had to halt the studies because yeah. of the tragic fatality. Um, and so we're getting back to that point now. Look, with the mRNA technology, with the, the COVID vaccines, that has just accelerated our ability, our ability, the really smart researcher's ability <laughs> uh, <laughs> to, you know, to try yeah. to devise new ways of, of um getting the immune system to adapt and, and be less reactive to these allergens. So yes, it, I mean, it really is. I, I 10 years from now, it's going to be a completely different landscape. So if, for anybody out there who's looking for hope, I'm giving you hope and it's very real hope. These aren't false promises. That's um, great. I, I hear this particularly from parents who are watching kids who are coming up toward college and they're, they're like, I really want to get this done. So um, that would be, that would be amazing. Um, so Dr. Dave, Again, for Food Allergy Awareness Week, what's your takeaway message for food allergy awareness? Well, I have a couple of messages. One is for the entire world and the general public. Um, those people who have food allergies, they're not choosing to have these allergies. They need to avoid their allergens because exposure can actually make them pretty sick or potentially have life-threatening or fatal reactions. So we need to just um, have empathy and understanding and, and you know help them achieve these very, very easily attainable goals of uh, not eating their allergen. Um, so we need to support them. And for those living with food allergies or who have children with food allergies, again, I want to give you a message of hope. There is a positive path forward. Uh, that's something we deal with every day. We meet folks that have either multiple food allergies, severe food allergies, or, or high levels of anxiety, uh, and we can find ways to help them. So please, um, you know, seek evaluation from a board certified allergist if you have concerns about allergies um, and uh, just try to stay positive, you can do it. That's great. And just from allergic living standpoint, we're advocating for a few things. One of the things we're, we're pressing for, it, some of your doctor colleagues you've seen lately talking about this, we want epinephrine in those airline uh, kits. You shouldn't find out that, oh, there's the one, the dosage for cardiac, but not for uh not for uh, having anaphylaxis. It's really important when you're in the air. That's the sort of understanding of the seriousness of the, and the pervasiveness of this uh, condition. And uh, just from the, the more positive standpoint of, of you know, within our community, uh, I really encourage people to, you know, do that homework and, and live life well. We're called allergic living for a reason. You know, we really believe, you know, I don't want a half life. I, I have multiple food allergies. I think it's really important to live well. And if you struggle with that, as you say, talk to your allergist. If you're really struggling with anxiety, there are actually good therapists who understand food allergy now, which never used to exist. So it, these are encouraging times in, in many, many ways. Dr. Dave and uh, for, for Quad AI and the allergists, 
thank you so much for taking the time today and uh, happy Food Allergy Awareness Week. Thank you, Gwen.